The headlines sound scary. The U.S. assassinated a senior leader from Iran. Iran responded by lobbing missiles at military bases in Iraq where U.S. troops are stationed. How should investors respond? Stay tuned as we discuss how the investment team analyzes geopolitical events such as this one. Hello, this is Jim Lowell, Chief Investment Officer at Advisor Investments. I'm here with Brian Mackey, our Deputy Director of Research, to discuss the recent escalated conflict between the U.S. and Iran, and hopefully, over the coming days, what will be a de-escalation of that potential conflict. I know that Brian, our Deputy Director, has done some research together with the team to provide context on the ongoing conflict with Iran. Brian, when something like this happens between the U.S. and Iran, what type of analysis do you do for the investment team? Yeah, we really try to step back a bit and take a page from Mark Twain, who is famous for saying, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And so what we do is we'll look back at times in history that are similar to uh, conflicts like today with the conflict with Iran and look for how did the market respond to those events. And if we can come up with some type of pattern that we see in history, then we might be able to use that to inform our decisions for today. Well, you invoked Mark Twain, so I'll give you another quote from Mark Twain, <laughs> which is that there are liars, damn liars, and statisticians. <laughs> Puts those all the way down on the bottom rung. In terms of the patterns that we're looking for, uh, both in terms of risk and opportunity, for that matter, uh, ran uh, conflict today, but we know there's several other conflicts, and we know, of course, the region is rife with conflicts in the Middle East and has been uh, for time immemorial. Could you uh, could some type of conflict in the Middle East, uh, cyber attacks, for example, maybe an all-out boots on the ground war, total de-escalation, no conflict at all? How do you factor those kinds of considerations into your research and then your analysis of what you're looking at? Yeah, so we really try to take it one by one, where we'll say, okay, one scenario might be uh, Iran has some type of fight with Saudi Arabia or the United States in the Middle East, that there's some type of conflict that goes on there. And uh, fortunately, or rather unfortunately, there's a lot of data on conflict in the Middle East for us to look at in history and say, okay, there were periods of uh, an oil embargo, there were wars, there were all these different types of issues that went on. How did the stock market react? How did commodity prices react? Uh, and one thing we notice is that commodities in particular tend to do pretty well during those periods. That, uh, and that kind of makes sense that if there's conflict in the Middle East, you'd see oil supplies uh, get get cut off, and so therefore prices might go up. Uh, there's also potentially fear from there being war in the Middle East, and gold tends to do well when fear is, is uh, in the market. And so we see kind of gold commodities tending to do pretty well in those periods. So that kind of fear trade, of course, we have seen time and time again over this last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, set aside Iran for, uh, mm -hmm. for today's event-driven news and look over our shoulders. And this market and investors have been sorely tested time and again. Yep. That their fear trade over the past decade simply hasn't panned out. Uh, this time around, should we be buying gold or commodities right now? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point and a great question. Um, you know, in the past, it hasn't worked out. Um, and I think the real reason why we tried to avoid commodities at advisor investments, generally speaking, is uh, they haven't had a great long-term return. Even not, you know, you mentioned over the last decade, but even over the past 50 years, uh, they've tended to perform roughly in line with inflation, going up about two or three percent a year. And what we're trying to do is really beat inflation so that uh, our, our savings, our, our client savings, are growing faster, and we're able to buy more stuff in the future with it. Um, and so. Yes, they do. These commodities do well during periods of stress, but um, but they don't do well in other periods. And when you look at the stock market, um, what we've seen there is during those same periods of stress, stocks tend to do well. They you know they might sell off in a day, but a month later, a year later, they're back to normal. And for that reason, we kind of say, well, why not just stick with something like stocks where they've done well during periods of stress, um, but more importantly, they've done well over the long term as well. And probably a, a correspondent theme, certainly something we practice here at Advisor Investments, have been doing so for 25 years, is that we take a disciplined and diversified approach to not just the domestic, but the global markets. Mm -hmm. And that's not just in the stock markets. Uh, we also ensure that we are always riding with at least some level of bond buffers for the majority of our clients' portfolios, mm -hmm. as well as even some cash reserves to be able to take advantage of market downdrafts uh, or just offset what we might feel is the time where greater volatility may intrude into the market. Yep, and that makes a, a ton of sense. 
What about the 1970s? That was a time when the stock market didn't do well because of the oil embargo and higher oil prices. And they weren't just nominally higher, uh, nor for that matter was inflation. It really was skyrocketing. Yeah, so the 1970s, I'll admit that was before my time, but um, but we can look back at the data, and that was, you're right, that was a period where when the the Arab uh, community came out and the Arab governments came out and said, we're no longer selling oil to the U.S., and there was this big embargo, um, that did have an impact on the stock market. And so I think it's worth taking a look at why that happened. Um, in the 70s, the U.S. was importing about six to eight million barrels of oil every day. Um, so we needed that oil, and when prices went up, that really hurt the economy, and that's why we saw the stock market sell off in the 70s. Um, fast forward to today, a lot has changed. Um, a, the economy is a lot bigger, um, but more importantly, uh, fracking technology has totally changed the game in the last decade. Are we allowed to say fracking on a <laughs> podcast, Brian? I think uh, I think our <laughs> marketing team can bleep out words if I mispronounce them. Um, but but yeah, so that that's led to a massive uh, ups, uptick in the amount of production of oil in the United States. And so I mentioned we were importing a lot of oil in the 70s. Um, this at the end of last year, at the end of 2019. Uh, we actually started net exporting oil. So higher oil prices hurt us in the 70s, um, but could actually help the U.S. economy uh, this time around. So we know that the situation uh, between the U.S. and Iran currently is one that's prone to uh, conflagration. And it would be a very serious engagement, uh, unlike Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. Yeah. Uh, Iran has a battle-tested, zealous force. And the worst possible thing for uh, the U.S., both as a as a nation, but also for a market, would likely be to step into the throes of war. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we we uh, are able to avoid the boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, even if we don't have to worry about boots on the ground in the Middle East, uh, what about some type of covert, or for that matter, overt mm -hmm. cyber attack? Something that the Iranians have already done mm -hmm. uh, certainly have demonstrated that are, that they're not just willing but capable of doing. Yeah, and I think that's something that we've seen a lot of headlines and, and sort of Middle East experts come out and say that's one of the, the more likely ways that the, the Iranian government may respond. Um, and so it's it's tough to predict what how that's going to impact the markets because um, if you think about it, in if you know we try to look at uh, times of history uh, to inform ourselves, and there isn't a ton of history uh, of you know governments using cyber warfare against uh, other governments or other companies. Um, but there is similar. Uh, there are similar events out there that we can use as proxies. So, if you think about one of the main types of cyber attacks, would be an attack on the infrastructure of the United States. So, knocking out um, the data related to pipelines working correctly, or the energy infrastructure, um, and the you know the utility and power infrastructure of our of our country. Um, that's kind of similar to like a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, um, like where a hurricane comes in and, and knocks out a bunch of infrastructure as well. And so what we can do is look at that and say, well, if, if a cyber attack has a similar impact as a hurricane, how did the market respond in a hurricane? Maybe it'll have the same response in, in a cyber attack. And what we've seen historically is, is very similar to what happens with periods of tension in the Middle East, where supply is disrupted and so commodities tend to do well. Um, gold and oil tend to tend to bounce up a bit. Um, however, the stock market also tends to do pretty well in that period. So companies are able to pass on those higher input costs onto the consumer, and and that you know leads to profits being okay. And so the stock market tends to do fine. And so again, going back to that point about yes, they both do well in the short term if there's periods of stress, but stocks do better in the long term, which is why we always kind of try to focus on the stock market. Um, but Jim, I guess I'd like to, you know, you and I have talked a lot in the in really the last week, not just this podcast about Iran and the stock market. Um, what would you take away from all this, all the headlines you've seen? How should investors be responding? Hopefully we're doing a good job, Brian, in terms of our weekly communications with clients about the fact that neither fear nor hope are investment strategies, nor is pursuing headline uh, risks, which are always theoretical in nature, uh, nor pundits who uh, make their living basically predicting uh, what is, uh, as yet, an unknown actual outcome. Mm -hmm. So we continue to say that uh, a disciplined approach to the fundamentals, earnings, interest rate, the economic data that we can, in fact, know, that continue to suggest that we're on a slow growth, not no growth trajectory, especially given that the Fed is in the corner of defending that slow growth, not no growth trajectory, 
is the best path to pursue. I would say, though, that if you're feeling uncomfortable, uh, if you're uh, feeling nervous about what's going on in terms of not just Iran, but but Brexit, the impeachment process, anything that may hmm. be uh, sort of monkeying with your your defined risk tolerance, or uh, even beginning to uh, have you question your investment objectives and goals, your income needs, your return expectations, give us a call. That's why we're here. We are the investment advisor you can talk to. Couldn't have said it better myself. Brian, thanks so much for your insights and analysis. Uh, I know that we here at Advisor Investments find them reassuring, and we wanted to make sure that our clients were so reassured. This is Jim Lowell from Advisor Investments, thanking you for listening to the Advisor You Can Talk To podcast. If you found this conversation interesting, please subscribe and review our show. You can also check us out at www.advisorinvestments.com forward slash podcast forward slash. Your feedback is always welcome. And if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to explore, please email us at info at advisorinvestments.com. 